Now, the uh, next statement is going to be made by Mr. Agaros, Queen's Council, on behalf of the TMO, and he's uh, elected to make his statement uh, remotely. So the first thing I have to do is to ensure that we can see and hear each other well. Mr. Agaros, I can see you. I hope you can yes. see me, can mm -hmm. you? I can hear you, Mr. Chairman. I hope you can hear me. I can. Thank you very much. And we can see each other, I hope. Yes, thank you very much. Good, <laughs> thank you. Well, you're going to make a um, closing statement in Module 3 on behalf of the TMO. That is correct. And, um, uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, panel members. At the outset of these submissions, the TMO wishes to reiterate that its deepest sympathies and condolences lie with the bereaved survivors and residents. So we acknowledge the immense tragedy of the Grenfell Tower fire, and nothing in these submissions is intended to diminish or detract from that tragedy. TMO witnesses gave evidence across all topics in Module 3 of Phase 2, and their, and their evidence spanned many days. They were questioned intensively on all matters relevant to Module 3. One thing the TMO invites the inquiry to keep in mind when considering these submissions is that while the TMO continues to exist as a corporate entity, this is for the purposes of assisting the inquiry as a core participant and in recognition of the fact that it may feature in future legal proceedings. All the present directors are non-executive directors and none was imposed at the time that matters addressed in the inquiry were occurring. Considering this, the submissions made on behalf of the TMO are by way of comment on the evidence, which of course the inquiry may accept or, or reject, but they should not be construed as the corporate views of the TMO, as there is now no one corporate voice. So the other thing to consider is that on some occasions under questioning, TMO witnesses accepted that, certain, that a certain course of action or situation amounted to a breach of the RRO and ultimately whether there was a breach of the RRO in particular circumstances is a matter for the inquiry, and a witness's subjective view of whether there was a breach or not is not fully determinative of the issue. The, inquiry, the, the TMO also invites the inquiry to be careful to avoid passing judgment based on hindsight and submits it should have a clear idea, a clear eye to what was the state of knowledge in the industry at the time when deciding whether there was a breach or not. So also to say that a particular course of conduct or situation amounted to a categorical breach of the RRO is problematic when the inquiry considers that its own experts frequently express conflicting views about how to comply with a given provision. The inquiry will be considering the, R the, inquiry will be considering the RRO in detail in the later module. We'll have to grapple with the question of whether the RRO is and was fit for purpose and or requires substantial amendment. So can I deal first with topic two, which is the TMO's obligations and duties under the RRO, and particularly the composition of the external wall as part of the RRO. An important issue covered by the inquiry was whether the composition of the external wall during and after the refurbishment fell within the terms of the RRO, and therefore should have been considered as part of the TMO's fire risk assessment. Colin Todd gave important evidence on this topic during questioning. He said that in his view, which he considered to be representative of the wider view of the fire risk, fire risk assessment trade, the external wall did not fall to be considered under the RRO as it was not a common part and the RRO only applied to common parts. He pointed to the fact that a similar view was expressed by the then DCLG in the immediate aftermath of the Grenfell Tower fire. He said that prior to the Shepherd's Court fire, he was not aware of fire authorities who took a different view and cited the fact that a senior officer of LFB had said before the Fire Safety Act came into force that external cladding was not yet part of the RRO. He also did not think that the external wall formed part of the compartmentation and so did not fall to be considered as part of the RRO from that perspective either. Colin Todd said that when he had been involved in drafting the LGA guide and PAS 79, he and his fellow authors had thought it appropriate to give a general warning about the dangers of cladding, but without any specific reference to ACM, 
but still did not consider it was part of the RRO and therefore did not refer to it in the section of the LGA guide concerned with risk assessment. He said that there was nothing in other guidance provided to fire risk assessors, i.e. the sleeping guide, guidance note number one and LACORs, which would lead to a contrary conclusion. So it's noted that even Dr. Lane struggled to reach a conclusion on whether the external wall fell within the scope of the RRO, and she acknowledged a body of opinion that it did not. It is submitted that the reason she gave as to why it might fall within the RRO, that it is a collective, protect, collective protective measure if it abuts an internal compartment or common part, does not on analysis apply, as the common lobby at Grenfell Tower is landlocked and did not abut the external wall. The, the submission made that Colin Todd wrongly conflated his and his practice's view with the view of the trade is noted, but it submitted the inquiry is entitled to hold that his view is properly representative of the industry because he occupies a senior post within the industry and was one of the authors of PAS 79 and the LJ Guide. Colin Todd's view was that the RRO cut in, as he said it, after the building regulations had been applied and he considered it was reasonable to place weight on the fact that building control both approved, or at least did not demur in, the initial installation of the cladding, and then signed it off as compliant. It is also significant that the Fire Safety Act recently amended the RRO to say clearly that external walls, including windows and doors in multi-occupancy buildings, do fall within the scope of the RRO. So the need for such an amendment is strong evidence it's submitted that the external wall was not previously within the scope of the RRO, or at least support for the proposition that it was reasonable not to think it was. The question may rightly be asked whether other responsible persons or their fire risk assessors who had buildings clad in ACM addressed this in their fire risk assessment, and if they did not, this tends to suggest that industry practice was not to, not to include it in those assessments. As to whether Carl Stokes should have suggested that the TMO appoint a specialist, the TMO invites the inquiry to adopt the view of Colin Todd, that it wouldn't have been appropriate, and I quote, sir, that it wouldn't have been appropriate to take a project that has just been completed, completed under building regulations, and pay a rarefied specialist to come along and drill holes in it and stick a bore scope to see if any cavity barriers were in place. Dealing now with the letter from the London Fire Brigade, dated the 6th of April 2017, Tall Buildings External Fire Spread. On receipt of the letter from RBKC, Janice Ray passed it on to Carl Stokes, among others, and he confirmed that Grenfell Towers cladding, quotes, complied with the requirements of the building regulations, lots of questions asked of Rydens and answers received back from them. While with hindsight, <clears throat> excuse me, while with hindsight, the sufficiency of his response may be questioned, it is submitted that it was a reasonable approach to take following an extensive refurbishment by specialist companies and in the light of the wider view about the acceptability of such cladding at the time. The TMO sit, submits that it's highly unlikely to think that a unilateral inquiry conducted at that time no matter how intensively it was conducted, might have uncovered the terrible er error of cladding Grenfell Tower in combustible materials without adequate cavity barriers. This was a project which had been conducted in plain sight, including of the LFB during their 7-2D visits over a period of years, and at no, party, at no point had any party said it was dangerously misguided. The fact that so many other buildings were and continue to be clad in similarly dangerous materials speaks to the very remote possibility that any one investigation would have exposed the deep-seated and far-ranging misconception that gave rise to the tragedy at Grenfell Tower. It's a matter for the inquiry, but the TMO submits that the more pressing question is not why the 2017 letter was not responded to differently, but why, in the light of evidence heard in Module 4, about the fire service's wider awareness of the dangers of ACM cladding, the more urgent alarm was not sounded earlier and more widely. Further, the letter sent by the LFB related to spandrel panels and not the ACM panels installed at Grenfell Tower. Colin Todd, 
said it was right to make a distinction between them and ACM cladding. Janice Ray's response, I can confirm that it is our understanding that we do not have any blocks with cladding of the nature described in the LFB's letter was not incorrect. Laura Johnson of RBKC also understood it was not the same cladding involved in the Shepherd's Court fire. Turning now to the TMO's, TMO's approach to fire risk assessments, in particular Article 9 of the RRO. When the LFB recommended that the TMO engage an external fire risk assessor, it immediately did so, and Salvas was appointed in September 2009 to carry out fire risk assessments on the TMO's high-risk housing stock. So we appreciate that the inquiry will carefully consider the circumstances in which Carl Stokes was appointed after Salvus, the quality of service he provided to the TMO, and the extent to which his performance was reviewed over time. And so this is likely to include consideration of whether there was any irregularity around his appointment, and if there was, what were its effects? In relation to this suggested irregularity, it submitted the explanation Janice Ray gave should dispel concern that the process was deliberately manipulated. She said the TMO treated all applicants fairly and equally at interview, and the interview was attended by an RBKC housing representative and another professional service colleague. Regarding the inform information given to Carl Stokes in a letter before the interview, she said that a lot of that information would have been covered verbally at the beginning of every interview, and certainly Salvas, another applicant, had that information. In general, the TMO accepts that also, although some concerns were latterly raised about aspects of Carl Stokes' performance, and there were certainly some anomalies and vagaries in his assessments, which the inquiry has scrutinised. The fact is Janice Ray was aware of them and the concerns expressed about him, but these taken collectively were not of a type that justified dispensing with him and his services altogether. In any event, on the question of his actual and ostensible competence, the inquiry cannot overlook its submitted Colin Todd's opinion that Carl Stokes' fire risk assessments were, in general terms, suitable and sufficient, and amongst, a quote from Colin Todd, some of the most detailed of the many thousands he had seen. Colin Todd said he did have suitable experience and training to be, to be trained properly to be regarded as competent. The key qualification he held was the European diploma from the FPA, as well as his long experience as a fire safety officer. Even Dr. Lane agreed that on paper, Carl Stokes had done the correct courses. Although Carl Stokes wrongly used post nominals and the inquiry will, it, will assess the circumstances in which he represented himself as having these, Colin Todd thought this did not obviate the fact that he had the correct academic qualifications and merely amounted to an unnecessary attempt, as he put it, Colin Todd put it, to big himself up. Also, by the time Carl Stokes was appointed, he had done numerous fire risk assessments on TMO high risk blocks for Salvas. So Janice Ray had first hand experience of his work. Salvas had also quality checked his work, and all of his risk assessments were provided to the LFB for review. Colin Todd did not agree that a fire risk assessor should be su sufficiently qualified and educated to be able to examine the external wall as part of his fire risk assessment. So the inquiry also explored the issue of whether the TMO should have appointed a sole practitioner such as Carl Stokes. It's a matter for the inquiry, so, but against the background of poor performance or alleged poor performance by so many corporate entities, the, the, the simple premise that it was inadvisable to appoint and rely upon a sole practitioner is open to question. In any event, Colin Todd said he knew of many extremely good sole practitioners who do a very good job without anyone reading or peer reviewing their reports. The TMO acknowledges that there came a time in 2015 when the LFB expressed concerns about some of Carl Stokes' works, work, but against the background of his wider performance and considering Colin Todd's views generally, it submitted that these were not so serious as to have caused the TMO to dispense with his services. Janice Ray said she fed these back to him, so he was aware of them. Further, as RBKC noted in their written submissions, 
The last risk assessment carried out by Carl Stokes on Grenfell Tower in 2016 was deemed to be suitable and sufficient by the inspecting fire officer. One issue is whether Carl Stokes ought to have said in ad hoc advice to the TMO that the cladding complied with the requirements of building regulations without having verified it himself. Dr. Lane was extremely critical of this and Colin Todd was questioned on it, but he said that Carl Stokes' statement was reasonable in the circumstances and any criticism of it would be pedantic. Turning now to the issue of the competent person under Article 18, touching on Janice Ray, her experience and qualifications. So contrary to some of the submissions made by core participants in written closing submissions on Module 3, the TMO maintains the submission that Janice Ray was a hardworking and conscientious health and safety professional who worked effectively and efficiently despite at times being overstretched. While as she accepted, she could have done things differently or better, of whom can that not be said, especially when their conduct is subject to forensic scrutiny? Janice Ray started working for the TMO in around 1989 and obtained a NEBOSH diploma, which is the globally recognized health and safety qualification. She's also a chartered member of the Institution of Occupational Health and Safety, and this required her to maintain high levels of continuous professional development, which she did. She received training on the RRO when it was first introduced and attended several courses on it. She also attended two presentations on the Lackamore Fire and Shirley Towers Fire in 2013-2014. Her assistant health and safety advisor, Adrian Bowman, had also been with the TMO for a long period of time and was himself Nebosch qualified. Cyril Morris, the third member of the team, had joined the TMO in 2011 and reported to her. She received training on the 2006 Sleeping Guide, and it is submitted, and it is submitted, was familiar with PAS 79 to a level appropriate for a competent person engaging a specialist fire risk assessor. She was also familiar with the LACORS Guide. She had an overview of BS 9991 and was familiar with the guide Fire Safety and Purpose-Built Blocks of Flats, published in 2011. Janice Ray was far more familiar with the LGA guide, published in July 2011, and in fact had been consulted on it during its production. So the inquiry will note that the LGA guide was produced as a specific reaction to the Lacanor fire, as it was considered that there was a lack of guidance dealing specifically with fire safety in high-rise residential blocks. Indeed, statements made within the guide itself, which were referred to in written submissions, and so which we don't propose to go into in these oral submissions, support the proposition that it was to be used in preference to other guides, and therefore it was right that Janice Ray paid particular attention to it. She was also a member of the London and South East Health and Safety Group for the public sector, which was attended by health and safety housing professionals from different local authorities. At this forum, she inquired how others were seeking to comply with legislation and guidance and use this to benchmark TMO's compliance, including towards vulnerable residents. Her conclusion was that the TMO compared well to others, and so the inquiry has heard no evidence to dispute this. She also had regular two monthly meetings with the LFB, as well as being an attendee at the RBKC Main Health and Safety Committee, which met every six weeks, and later became the Byborough Health and Safety Group in conjunction with Hammersmith and Fulham. She also had regular meetings with Gary Mann, one of RBKC's corporate health and safety advisors. Submissions have been made by some core participants that others in the TMO, including Barbara Matthews and Sasha Jevons, ought to have been trained in fire safety. While it's right that the inquiry considers these suggestions, the TMO submits that it was not necessary for them to have any specific fire safety qualifications to exercise their managerial role of Janice Ray. As to whether Janice Ray ought to have been part of the senior management team, Robert Black, from whom you heard, said that he did not think it was necessary for her to be part of that team or the executive team. His view, his view was that she was influential within the organisation from the position she occupied. 
And so it submitted that having her outside the operational contractual side of the organization was logical and preserved her independence. She was the key report in health and safety meetings chaired by Sasha Jevons and then Barbara Matthews, both of whom, both of whom were members of the executive team. And so she could escalate matters to that team through her dealings with them. An issue that was raised was whether Janice Ray was overstretched and whether she had the resources to carry out her role effectively. She agreed that she was spread very thinly, to use her words, but she and her team, and so this was three, not two, as was suggested, were adept, again, to use her words, at prioritising and making things work. And fire safety was always top of the pile. She accepted that resources influenced how quickly some things were done. For example, she accepted that the fire safety strategy took longer to develop than it ought to have done. But as she said, she chased, chivied and escalated matters to the best of her ability. She also said that the contracts team had various responsibilities for fire safety matters. And so compliance was not solely down to her and her team. So when considering whether she was under-resourced, the inquiry should bear in mind it submitted that these were times of cuts and austerity. And the TMO's budget was limited by government, as with any other social housing body at that time. Robert Black indeed said local authority funding was cut from 2009. And when he took over, there had been a budget cut of £500,000 or 2%. Although the, the TMO is criticised in some quarters for not seeking additional funding, Robert Black explained that all similar bodies were having to adjust to funding cuts and there was no magic pot of money. Whether a result by the TMO for more money from RBKC would have resulted in more money being allocated is essentially speculative. But so it's noteworthy that when a request was made for, site, for finance for a door closer inspection and maintenance programme, the response was only partially positive. Janice Ray was questioned on whether she tried to challenge the LFB in an, in an inappropriate manner, forgive me, i.e. why she did not merely acquiesce in what the F LFB was saying the TMO should do. One example considered was the challenge to the LFB in February 2010, which concerned retrofitting dry risers at Gilray House and in four other blocks over 80 metres. Her explanation for the challenge was that this would cause huge disruption to residents and it submitted there is some force in this and her challenge was consistent with a public sector professional seeking to avoid disruptive and intrusive works on a residential block where possible. She said that she made challenges of this type to determine whether the LFB requirements were national and or across London and it submitted that this was not unreasonable. Dealing now with a separate and general topic about the failure to escalate concerns expressed over time. So several witnesses, including Janice Ray and Robert Black, were questioned extensively on whether the TMO sought deliberately to conceal or downplay important information from both residents and the TMO board. It has been suggested in some written submissions that if residents had been provided with information about, for example, the fact that Studio E was inexperienced in cladding high-rise blocks, that zinc was to be replaced with ACM cladding, and that XO's reports were not comprehensive nor updated, the fire at Grenfell Tower could have been averted. Dealing first with the suggestion, with the suggested withholding of information from residents. While the TMO accepts that these are important questions to ask, it's submitted that it's highly unlikely that even if the residents were provided with the information which it is said they were denied, this would have averted the tragedy at Grenfell Tower. As has been said before, but importantly, the causes of the tragedy at Grenfell Tower were deep-seated and far-ranging. And so we would submit that it's unrealistic to think that the actions of one group, even the residents of the tower, would have been adequate to unpick them and avert the fire. Concerning the allegation that any TMO employee acted in bad faith towards residents, this is not accepted. It's ultimately a matter for the inquiry to judge, but it's submitted that TMO employees were all well-intentioned and conscientious individuals who had made the vocational choice to work in social housing. 
and it's submitted that it's highly improbable that they would ever have deliberately and purposefully sought to deceive or disadvantage the residents whom they served. Now dealing with the question of whether the TMO ever concealed the fact that it had been issued with notices of deficiency or downplayed or sanitized other serious concerns as expressed about it or Carl Stokes. It's accepted that before the Adair Tower fire at the end of 2015, the TMO did not have a bespoke system for registering and escalating NODs. And it is accepted that this may have led to them not being dealt with any in a sufficiently formal way. That there was no such system is likely connected with the fact that, as Janice Ray said, NODs were non-statutory notices and were considered to be the lowest level of enforcement by the LFB. Non-compliance with NODs did not result in formal action, but could cause them to be escalated to an enforcement notice. Janice Ray said that pre-Adair, the TMO did not receive a lot of NODs, and those it did receive and often only contained two or three recommendations that were easily resolved. While it seems right, and it is accepted, sir, that some notices were not brought to the direct attention of the TMO board, the inquiry is invited to accept Janice Ray's evidence that on receipt of a notice of deficiency, she would provide an update at the next available opportunity to either the TMO, TMO's operations committee, the health and safety committee and the executive team, and she would record it in the TMO's annual health and safety reports. Such reporting is, we submit, not consistent with the suggestion that they were deliberately underplayed or concealed from councillors or the TMO board. So also, while it's accepted that the receipt of a deficiency notice should have been minuted at, for example, board meetings, the mere fact that they were not minuted does not mean to say that they were not discussed there or elsewhere. Janice Ray said that as time progressed, the TMO became more overt, to use her word, about publicising them, but generally the TMO would be having discussions with the LFB about how best to address the issues raised. So how they were escalated is certainly an important matter to consider, but it's submitted that it's more important to consider whether the matters raised in the notices themselves were dealt with properly, and it's submitted the evidence shows that they generally were. Certainly no more serious enforcement action was taken against the TMO for failing to deal with matters in, an, in a notice of deficiency. Following the Adair fire, the format and structure of fire safety updates to the TMO board changed, and the TMO began listing all NODs that had been received. The board was therefore told about the receipt of NODs in November 2016 and March 2017. And a summary of the, the enforcement notice for Adair Tower was sent by email to the board on the 12th of January 2016 including that a similar enforcement notice was also expected for Hazelwood Tower. In relation to the suggestion that the force of the Matt Hodgson report was hidden from the board, so whatever conclusions the inquiry reaches about the way in which the report was escalated, it cannot be said that it was ignored. The TMO did indeed use his report to change or amend some of its processes, including the provision of health and safety training to senior members of TMO staff, including Sasha Jevons, and the formation of the Operational Health and Safety Committee commenced. Regarding the suggestion that the criticisms of Carl Stokes were kept from the board, the first time that substantive criticisms were raised by the LFB was after the Adair Tower fire. By this time, he had been in post for several years and had developed a good reputation his risk assessments had been provided to the LFB across time without any substantive criticism. It's also significant that his last risk assessment before the fire and after the concerns expressed by the LFB in 2015 was considered by the LFB Fire Safety Inspecting Officer Michelle McHugh and she deemed it to be suitable and sufficient. Janice Ray said she investigated the criticisms that were made to her and said that as there was no sustained history of concerns being flagged, she was satisfied about Carl Stokes' over, overall competence. Barbara Matthews pointed out in evidence that the TMO had begun a re-procurement process in relation to its appointed fire risk assessor as a natural consequence of the time that he had remained in post, 
And so, so therefore, it cannot be said that the TMO was in some way hanging on to Carl Stokes, come what may, and in the teeth of adverse comment. Again, while the TMO accepts that it's right to consider, consider whether legitimate concerns were properly escalated, the inquiry may consider the more important issue is whether Carl Stokes was competent and whether the TMO had a basis for thinking this. On these topics, it's submitted the inquiry cannot properly overlook the evidence of its own specialist in fire risk assessment, Colin Todd, who commended much of Carl Stokes' performance. Dealing now with the FRA action backlog, a significant topic covered in module three was the nature of the backlog of the fire risk assessment actions and how it was dealt with by the TMO. When considering the backlog of FRA actions, it submitted the inquiry should at least attempt to benchmark the TMO situation with that of other local authorities and or other social housing providers at the relevant time. In this way, it will be able to verify whether what was said by TMO witnesses that they had benchmarked TMO's performance across the sector and found it was in a stronger position than many others was correct. In general terms, the TMO sits, submits that it always sought to keep abreast of the problem of outstanding FRA actions and always made constructive efforts to drive the numbers down. While the level of outstanding action certainly ebbed and flowed, the TMO was always making robust efforts to reduce the number. Several issues led to the high initial number of outstanding actions, as well as the number going forward. A high number of outstanding actions had arisen prior to 2012, as the TMO's responsive repairs contract with Morrison's was failing. Sasha Jevons said that there were always problems with the contractor who knew it was coming to the end of its tenure. The backlog worsened through difficulties encountered with RGE, the contractor responsible for the maintenance of fire safety equipment across the housing stock. However, when the TMO received a limited assurance rating in the RBKC Health and Safety Audit in 2013, it did take positive steps by changing its structure and much of its personnel and re-procure the contract with RGE, which also included a lengthy adjudication process and brought in an interim contractor Chubb. As a direct result of the limited assurance order, the TMO brought in Matt Hodgson to conduct his review. And one of the consequences of this was the initiation, as I've said, of the Operational Health and Safety Committee, which was chaired by Sasha Jevons. The committee started to meet in September 2013. And around this time, the TMO was in the process of introducing the W2 workflow to improve the monitoring and completion of FRA actions. Janice Ray sent the relevant teams a spreadsheet of actions downloaded from W2 on a bi-monthly basis and would also report on the status of FRA actions to the health and safety committees, which reported into the executive, executive team and in the annual health and safety report and within the health and safety section of the CEO's report to the TMO board. The TMO accepts that the metric adopted in a number of these forms was completing FRA actions, completing outstanding FRA actions, rather than consistently highlighting which action items were high, low or medium risk and or the age profile of the action. However, as Janice Ray said, this information was available and it was disseminated along with the status of actions on a regular basis. As to the criticism that the TMA failed to take a holistic view of the state of risk at Grenfell Tower, in light of the fact that so many actions remained, remained unremediated, the TMA points to Colin Todd's evidence on the topic, that the risk associate, associated with an uncompleted action did not change as a function of how long it remained outstanding, although it's accepted that he said that this would give concern or should give concern about the wider management system, which the TMO acknowledges. Following the appointment of Barbara Matthews in June 2015, the two health and safety committees were brought under one umbrella, and under her leadership, there was a new focus. One of the initiatives was to have Janice Ray provide a further breakdown of outstanding action so the committee could see what was required to, to clear the backlog. Following this, Janice Ray included further information 
in relation to risk level, high, medium, low, for example. And lastly, the age profile, naught to three months, six to 12 months, et cetera, which provided a more accurate age and risk profile of, out, of outstanding actions. Although the backlog was not cleared, steady progress was made from late 2015. And by April 2016, there was a large drop in the number of outstanding actions. And so as the inquiry knows, significantly in 2016, the TMO received a substantial assurance rating in an RBKC health and safety audit, which was produced by external auditors. Notwithstanding the efforts made, in January 2017, Barbara Matthews expressed concern that there was still a volume of actions which had been outstanding for over 12 months, and requested that teams present an action plan at the next meeting. It seems likely that the slowing of improvement was because there had been another handover between two contractors, RGE to Allied Protection, which created, as Peter Madison put it, a turbulence in terms of performance during the transition period. At the March 2017 Health and Safety Committee, it was noted that there has been increased focus on clearing the backlog, as well as keeping current records up to date. Although Barbara Matthews again reiterated the need for all to continue, and I quote, prioritizing completing these and to prevent further actions falling into the 12 plus months category. Although it's accepted that there were many actions which fell into the 12 plus months category at this time, the inquiry is invited not merely to view the question of outstanding actions as a numbers game, but also to look at what their risk ratings were. It should also separately consider the question whether and to what extent any, any outstanding actions were implicated in the causes of the fire or influenced the severity of it once it had started. It was suggested that TMO, that the TMO, and in particular Peter Madison, sought inappropriately to reprioritize actions to reduce the backlog. The inquiry will view this evidence as it does, but it submitted that Peter Madison's conduct was consistent with a practical approach towards reducing a stubborn backlog, as he put it, as quickly and as effectively as possible. In relation to interim measures, the TMO's fire safety strategy dated November 2013 required that when a high priority action could not be progressed as urgently as possible because of, for, in, for instance, resources or procurement issues, then interim measures would be implemented. Janice Ray said she asked the contracts team to put measures in place, but in answer to, to your question, sir, the chairman's questions, she said she would not necessarily have made a documentary record of them, but would have discussed matters with Carl Stokes. She said, and I quote, I would have told him by email or on the telephone because we would have probably started off having discussions about what potential interim measures might be adequate. So now dealing with the topic of recording prescribed information, in particular, any group of persons identified by the assessments as being especially at risk in relation to Articles 9, Bracket 6 and 7 of the RRO. Articles 9, 6 and 9, 7 of the RRO required the responsible person to identify and then record information regarding persons especially at risk, particularly disabled residents. Colin Todd agreed that Article 9.7b did say that information should be included in the fire risk assessment about any group of persons identified by it as being especially at risk, but said that this was not normally acted on by the fire risk, fire risk assessment trade, even before the publication of the 2011 LGA guide, because of practical difficulties in obtaining and maintaining up-to-date information. Therefore, he said he would not normally have expected to see a detailed person-by-person -person breakdown in a fire risk assessment, but sir, and, and the TMO concedes, he did say that he would have expected Carl Stokes to ask whether the TMO had any arrangements in place for giving assistance to disabled people and whether it had some high-level generic information. While Dr. Lane took a different view, uh, as uh, she often did, um, as compared with Colin Todd, it's submitted that his view is likely to be more representative of the practice of the fire risk assessment trade at the time, and therefore a better yardstick for measuring the TMO's compliance. Dealing now with PEEPs, 
the TMO's general approach towards PEEPs was captured in Janice Ray's evidence. She said that PEEPs for residents in general needs housing blocks, unlike in sheltered housing, were not carried out because there was no because there were no staff present on site all the time, and so no one to assist in the evacuation of disabled persons in an emergency. In adopting this approach, the TMO was actually in a way consistent with the guidance provided in the 2011 LGA guide, which said, and I quote, sir, it's usually unrealistic to have in place special arrangements such as personal emergency evacuation plans, as they rely on the presence of staff or others available to assist the persons to escape in a fire. While the inquiry has not heard direct evidence on the point, it's submitted the TMO's approach was likely to be consistent with most other social housing provi providers. In fact, Sir Theresa Brown, from whom you heard, who had worked for the London Borough of Hammersmith and Fulham, said she could not recall having done any peeps there even after the production of the LGA guide. Although other guidance said different things about PEEPs and how the RRO should be interpreted, it submitted that the TMO is justified in following the LGA guide in preference to other guidance. Dr. Lane's suggestion that a range of guidance should have been consulted in our submission potentially amounted to the type of cherry picking that Rebecca Burton from the LFB said was undesirable. Colin Todd's view is that PEEPs were not reasonably practicable in general needs housing block blocks, and he stood by the statement in the LGA guide, which he noted had been read and approved by government lawyers during the consultation process. <laughs> Excuse me. Part of the rationale for the statement was, again, that there were significant problems ensuring that details in a PEEP remain current and the dangers of inaccurate information being passed onto the fire and rescue service might be more harmful than no information at all, as the fire service may spend valuable time searching for those about whom there was inaccurate information. In evidence, Colin Todd gave some stark examples of the type of problems that may arise in practice. Rebecca Burson of the LFB also agreed that it's very difficult to have peeps in place for general needs high-rise buildings. So the TMO accepts that Dr. Lane said this view is not consistent with the Equality Act 2010. And while, of course, the TMO acknowledges her view, it asks a rhetorical question, what compliance solution was available? So a matter for the inquiry, but it may be that the key to the problem lay in the initial allocation decision, which was outside of the TMO's hands. The TMO accepts that in some early correspondence, such as Robert Black's letters in 2010, and in the health and safety report to the board, it was suggested that PEEPs were being prepared when that never happened. It's certainly right that the reference to the preparation of PEEPs, particularly in the report, should have been amended. But so the TMO's final approach was dictated by what could practically be achieved and the provisions of the LGA guide. That this is a difficult and intractable issue is illustrated by the fact that even today, the topic, the topic generates many differing views and is still being consulted on by the government further to your recommendation, sir, in your phase one report. Turning now to the question of emergency routes and exits, Article 14 compliance with. The inquiry explored the issue of how the TMO should have been applying Articles 14 and 15 of the RRO particularly with Colin Todd. He said that when applying Article 14.2b, the interpretation of the fire risk assessment trade was the responsible person could rely on the fire and rescue services to evacuate disabled residents from the building. If residents were not able to use other designated routes, such as the protected stair. This was consistent with Janice Ray's view that it was for the LFB to use her words to call the shots on any necessary evacuation. Colin Todd said that stay put meant the responsible person didn't have to consider evacuating disabled people. And as far as able-bodied residents were concerned, his view was the TMO discharged its responsibilities under the article by the provision of, for example, the protected stair used as a place of refuge until the fire and rescue service could assist the person. He said this was because in the event of a fire, the building would be under the control of the FRS. 
Fire and Rescue Service. So while he recognised, rightly submitted, that these views may seem harsh towards the disabled and vulnerable, his interpretation was influenced by the fact that it, that it is and was vanishingly rare for people to die outside of their own flat in fires in purpose-built blocks of flats. And for this reason, planning for wider evacuation was negligible, as he put it, as compared to ensuring residents were safe in their own flats. His view was the safety of disabled people within their flats was not a matter for legislation, including the RRO, but it was for multi-agency cooperation to identify vulnerable people and ensure measures were taken to ensure they did not succumb because of a fire in their own flat. This is what he referred to as person-centred fire risk assessment or, or PCFRA. And so in this context, Teresa Brown said the TMO was concerned to identify those who were vulnerable and to refer them to neighbour teams when they needed additional support. Janice Ray said consideration was given to the safety of vulnerable individuals with their, within their own homes, citing how the TMO focused on hoarders and those whose sense of vulnerability led them to put protective metal gates on their front doors, which might hamper, hamper the LFB in their efforts to rescue them. So as the inquiry knows, around and before 2017, the TMO was making efforts to improve the data it held on vulnerable residents in its electronic systems, although it's accepted that the list produced on the night of the fire was incomplete. So rightly, Colin Todd was pressed on how his view could be squared with the contents of BS 9991, which suggested something different. He said that BS 9991 was primarily concerned with designing and managing new buildings and was an alternative to ADB. And whereas PAS 79 referred to the need for PEEPs, it too concentrated on non-residential buildings, recognising there would not be staff available to assist in the evacuation of a disabled resident in the event of a fire, as there was in business premises. Dr. Lane said BS 991, 9991 and the LGA guys should be read together, but she could not reconcile the two. She said she was not aware of any parts of PAS 79 not applicable to residential buildings, but it submitted that Colin Todd's view is to be preferred on account, amongst other things, of the limited reference to residential blocks of flats in that document. Whatever the inquiry may conclude in relation to the application of guidance, Dr. Lane said that what was key was the responsible person needed to ensure that the internal compartmentation and external wall remained, as she put it, reliable, so that they, and again to use her words, so, so that they are not entering into the deeply complex territory of needing to plan for the total evacuation of a high-rise residential building. Realistically, we submit, she agreed with your suggestion, sir, that in most cases, the risk of a catastrophic failure of a building of a kind that would require a total evacuation is too small to justify taking precautions against it. Turning now to the issue of emergency, emergency plans, procedures for serious and imminent danger, and for danger areas, Article 15 of the RRO. The question of emergency plans and the sufficiency of the TMO's emergency plan also needs to be considered in the light of the LGA guide, which says in paragraph 79.1, that rarely in purpose-built blocks of flats will it be necessary to have a more elaborate emergency plan than a simple fire action notice, nor will it be universally necessary to display, to display such notices. Colin Todd said the majority view was that in a block of flats, the Article 15 duty was satisfied by having a stay put strategy. He recognised that to call this an evacuation strategy was probably a misnomer because it was essentially a non-evacuation strategy. He did not say that a stay put strategy without more provided an answer, answer to Article 15, however. Rather, he stated the duty holder might be expected to tell residents that they should leave their flat if a fire started in it and leave if instructed by the fire and rescue service. And so as the inquiry knows, by the time of the fire, fire action notices have been installed in the communal areas at Grenfell Tower. And these read, and, and you've seen the notices, if you are safely within your flat and there is a fire elsewhere in the block, you should initially be safe to stay in your flat 
keeping the doors and windows closed. On arrival, the fire brigade will make an assessment and will assist with evacuation if required. While the sleeping guide said it was necessary to have an emergency plan to deal with any fire situation, it said that in simple premises, the emergency plan may be no more than a notice, but should be more detailed in multi-occupancy and complex premises. Colin Todd said Grenfell Tower is not a complex premises. Rebecca Burston also considered Grenfell Tower to be a simple premises, as it only had a single stair. So moving on now to discrete aspects of topic three of um, active and passive fire safety systems at Grenfell Tower and dealing with the flat front doors and door closers, including the initial procurement of doors and their installation. So the TMO recognises that out of the many topics considered in module three, one likely to give the inquiry particular concern is the topic of flat front doors and door closers, especially in the light of the BRE findings. It has been the, it has been the subject of intensive and often critical comment in the written submissions of many of the core participants. The inquiry heard detailed evidence about the circumstances in which the TMO embarked on a door replacement program. The TMO liaised with the London Housing Consortium on the scope of the flat door replacement program and the LHC provided access to an approved shortlist of companies in accordance with a framework agreement. One of the companies on the LHC's, LHC's pre-approved shortlist was Mance Masterdor. It seems that although originally indicated, the requirement for smoke seals was missing from the final specification set out in tender documents supplied to Mance Masterdor. Mance Masterdor ceased trading in 2014 and no witness then employed by it gave evidence at the inquiry. So the TMO, the TMO submits that the inquiry should view with caution what is said in the statements made by Mance Masterdor employees. And despite what some of those statements say, there is a strong argument that Mance was contracted by the TMO to provide FD30S doors, and that is what they purported to supply not least because it was known the doors were to be flat front doors and it was part of the contract that they comply with regulatory requirements. And so it's a matter of the inquiry, but it's noted that both RBKC and BSR Team 1 agree that this is what was contracted for. So whether FD30S doors were supplied needs to be viewed in the light of the BRE report, which said in respect of all flat front doors, the ironmongery and the presence of intumescent strips and cold smoke seals were generally consistent with those of a fire door. However, no labels, tags or other markings were found to indicate the door was a fire door. So it should also, it should also be kept in mind that Carl Stokes gave the TMO clear written advice that the doors were FD30S, although he failed to insist on test certificates being provided. Colin Todd, when asked about this, said that it was reasonable for Carl Stokes to come to that conclusion in light of all the evidence presented to him. Alex Foman of LHC attended the pilot installation and thereafter checked 10% of the doors installed for quality of installation. In his statement, he said that he would do a visual inspection of the intumescent strips for their presence. The evidence about the door's inability to resist fire for 30 minutes is deeply troubling, and further investigation showed the non-compliance between what Mance tested and supplied was on a nationwide scale. Whatever conclusion the inquiry reaches, reaches about the smoke seal element of the doors, it is submitted that the TMO cannot rightly be criticised for the fact that the doors were not able to withstand fire for 30 minutes. Turning now to the question of maintenance and installation, uh, maintenance and inspection following installation. So it's also recognised that TMO was on notice that some residents were disconnecting door closers. And there is evidence that one of the <coughs> estate service assistants, Seamus Dunley, disconnected some. Janice Ray became aware of this and told Siobhan Rumble, from whom you heard in evidence, to tell him, Seamus Dunley, that he should desist and the latter confirmed in an email that she had done this. 
The TMO acknowledges that the LGA, LGA guide, particularly the bullet points under 82.3, suggested that six monthly inspections should be carried out to identify potential defects and make sure doors remained in good condition. The TMO also acknowledges the evidence of Andy Jack from the LFB about a meeting in 2012, where he says monitoring and maintenance of door closers was discussed. Janice Ray said she did not well recall the meeting with him or any suggested periodicity for checks. Janice Ray accepted in evidence there was not an holistic program for inspection or maintenance, but the TMO had the intention to check door closers, including when flats became void and when the utility company, mainly the gas company, gained compulsory entry. However, as regards the latter check, she said the utility company had refused to consent to carry out an inspection on their visit. And so it's to be noted that these checks were checks of the type that were discussed, apparently, at the meeting with Andy Jack in 2012. Janice Ray said she was not aware of anyone who had a six monthly inspection program in place and all, so far as she was concerned, were struggling with the issue. After the Adair Tower fire, it became clear that there had been a genuine misunderstanding between the TMO and the LFB about what the latter required of the TMO in terms of inspection and maintenance of self of self closers. Janice Ray said that she had believed the TMO was supportive of the TMO, that the LFB was supportive of the TMO's approach. When considering how this confusion arose, the inquiry may note that notwithstanding the meeting with Andy Jack in 2012, the TMO had provided many fire risk assessments outlining its current practice on door closers to the LFB over the years and had not been challenged on the approach. Also in December 2013, Janice Ray emailed the LFB setting out what was its approach to door closers and never received a response to less one that demurred. In fact, even at the meeting between Rebecca and Janice Ray in, Jan in January 2016, where, where the LFB made it plain that the TMO's approach hitherto was not adequate, Rebecca Burton had said that checks could be done yearly, not six monthly, as the LGA guide suggested. That Rebecca Burton was advising differently to the LGA guide is indicative of the problematic nature of the exercise. And so it's also relevant that Carl Stokes never told the TMO that the guidance suggested a six monthly check when it's submitted, he reasonably ought to have done. The discussions with the LFB in January of 2016 led to Janice Ray acknowledging in the, in the September 2016 paper for discussion that the LFB was advising that the RRO requires regular inspection stroke maintenance of self closers and landlords must not rely exclusively on void checks to undertake these inspections. It's accepted that this occurred some nine months after the meeting with Rebecca Burton in January 16, as was explored in evidence. And the inquiry will no doubt consider Janice Ray's evidence that she was occupied with addressing the matters raised in the enforcement notice. It is not accepted, as has been suggested in some written submissions, that the TMO was instead, in some way, engaged in an exercise of trying to prove that it was not necessary to have an inspection regime. Rather, this was a situation where the TMO, being aware that its previous regime was, deemed, was now deemed to be unacceptable, was struggling to develop a solution to a difficult problem. Evidence of the fact that the TMO was seeking to find a workable solution is to be found in the paper for discussion dated the 1st of March 2017, where it was recorded that the TMO, and I quote, sir, the TMO has contacted a number of similar organisations seeking information on their policy with regard to self-closing devices. All respondents to date include City West, Haringey, Notting Hill Housing, et cetera, have confirmed that their policy is to ensure that all flat entrance doors are fitted with self-closers. However, approaches to inspection maintenance of these devices are much less clear. And that's the full quote, sir, or part of the quote. Janice Ray said that communications at the London and South East Housing Fire Safety Group revealed that while participants said they were regularly inspecting door closers, on closer analysis, was this was only when properties became void and there were major works. From her recollection, there were no dedicated inspection regimes of the kind that the TMO was trying to set up. 
as the inquiry knows, once attention was drawn to problems with self-closers, the TMO set about implementing a programme for flat door and self-closer inspection and maintenance, which it, which it expected to be completed within three years. It took its proposal to RBKC as it involved, involved a large separate capital expense. And RBKC said the programme should be spread over five, five years and not three years and also refuse funding for the inspection regime. The TMO notes what's been said in some of the core participants' closing submissions on the question of whether the TMO should have placed greater pressure on RBKC to complete the programme within three years, but submits that this is an unreasonable criticism of it. It should be remembered that the TMO did not often come to RBKC for large capital sums, and RBKC understood or should have understood that the request related to an important issue of fire safety in blocks for which it was landlord. If, which is not accepted, the TMO was not sufficiently insistent, RBKC had its own extensive health and safety team and could easily itself have opened up a line of dialogue with the LFB. So dealing with some discrete matters, Regarding whether all the matters in the November notice of deficiency were closed out, and in particular, flat 44. In evidence, it was put to Janice Ray, apparently based on the BRE schedule, it was a non-functioning door closer. And while it's right that the schedule said this, the full report said, and I quote, sir, the front door was destroyed. However, the metal frame was still in place. There was a hole concealed in in-leaf door closer, and the closer was found in the debris close to the door threshold. Three barrel hinges remained attached to a frame, and there was also a metal closing chain present. And therefore, the picture may not be so clear, as was put to Janice Ray in evidence. Also, the statement of the resident of flat 44, Turafat Yilma Girma, who lived there with her husband and son, says she left the flat twice, and on the second occasion, she locked the door behind her and ran to the stairwell with her husband. As regards other checks on flat front doors, Janice Ray said Carl Stokes was also inspecting a percentage of door closers as part of his fire risk assessments, including some from inside where he could, when he could gain access. Colin Todd said that the way that Carl Stokes approached checking front doors represented custom and practice for fire risk assessors at the time. And as to whether he should have recorded which doors had been inspected as part of the sample, he said he would do so, but not all fire risk assessors would. Matthew Ramsey from the LFB said he could not give a figure for how many doors he would knock on or what was an acceptable sample. He said his concern would be in relation to the condition of the doors that he did find. He said if Carl Stokes knocked on five doors and managed to get five open and all were self-closing, he would be reasonably happy. And so this, pro this approach is broadly in line with what Carl Stokes described himself as having done. Lastly, on this topic, Janice Ray said she also expected tenants to let the TMO know if there was any problem with their doors, specifically, Section 5.3.1 of the Tenancy Agreement required that the tenant will report all repairs and defects in the premises to the landlord or its agent immediately. So this is not to shift responsibility back onto the residents, but also to acknowledge that residents could themselves request such repairs. So now turning, um, I hope, briefly to, to two last topics, which is first the lifts at Grenfell Tower and then the gas riser replacement. Mm -hmm. The lifts at Grenfell Tower were originally installed in 1971 and refurbished in 2002 to 2006. Minor works were also carried out to the lifts during the refurbishment project in 2012-2016. Mr Halkins is unable to say whether the original lifts complied with the standards applicable in 1971 in every respect, but can say that the fireman's control switch did. The evidence in Module 3 touched on the question of whether the work in Project 1 was sufficiently extensive to require the lifts to be upgraded to modern firefighting standards. Many who gave evidence did not think that the upgrade was extensive enough to require them to be upgraded to those standards. 
And so whatever conclusions the inquiry reaches on this point, it should be noted the TMO was not advised by its specialist lift consultants, Butler and Young, that they should be so upgraded, even though Butler and Young had been asked to advise on the topic. And so it's right to say that Mr. Howkins said they should have advised on this. TMO acknowledges that Butler and Young witnesses said that Dave Steppel had given them contrary instructions. But so for the reasons given in the written submissions, which I'm not going to go into now, this must be doubtful. It's also noteworthy that prior to the commencement of Project 2, Cal Ford Cedon construction consultants also inspected and reported on the lifts and stated the lifts comply with the current British standards and health and safety requirements and health and safety requirements applicable at the time of installation stroke refurbishment. Regarding project two, an issue is whether a trap door should have been installed, but this should be viewed against the backdrop of the industry concern, particularly in social housing, that trap doors posed a security risk. Moreover, even if one had been installed, it would be unlikely to have afforded firefighters additional protection on the night of the fire, as a trapdoor is generally too small for adult persons to climb through and is used primarily to communicate with those trapped inside a lift from the outside. Regarding the important topic of fire keys, the TMO specified a drop key in its project brief as drop keys were used across the TMO's property portfolio, which included around, which included around 170 lifts. The LFB was aware that the fire control switch at Grenfell Tower was operated by a drop key and it tested the fire control switch using a drop key. So there was also wider concern as to which key was specified by the TMO in social housing that Euro keys and alternative were widely available and could be used by unauthorised persons. During project two, the fire control switch was relocated from the ground floor to the walkway and although it was disconnected, the TMO acknowledges the possibility that this could have caused confusion, although both Mr. Howkins and Dr. Lane agree that there is no evidence it did so on the night of the fire. Mr. Howkins said the lifts appear to be maintained to an appropriate standard and generally in compliance with the relevant standards and industry practice, and I quote that, sir. He said that best practice was to test the lifts weekly, but this was not what the prevailing standards required. And in any event, Mr. Todd agreed, disagreed, forgive me, with Mr. Howkins, stating that weekly testing was unduly onerous and to quote, putting more wear and tear on the switch and a more pragmatic period for testing would be one per month, as was the case at Grenfell Tower. And so notably, PAS 79 2020 has now changed to, to has changed to monthly testing to reflect the wider industry opinion. Carl Stokes did not recommend in his fire risk assessment that the TMO should undertake we weekly testing of the fire control switch, as he did not believe it was necessary if monthly checks were being conducted by a maintenance contractor. Peters was the TMO's appointed lift maintenance contractor from 2014 until the night of the fire and carried out planned preventative maintenance, including testing the fire control switch on a monthly basis. Mark Wallace of Peters, who gave evidence live before the inquiry, tested the, the fire control switch in both April and May 17, saying he checked, and quotes again, that the fire switch was in good and proper working order by inserting what is known as an express drop release key into the switch, activating the system and checking the lifts would immediately move to the bottom floor. Mr. Halkins believed that the testing conducted by Mr. Wallace was sufficient and the correct operation of the switch on 9th of May suggests that it was fully operational at that point in time if the correct key was used. Was used. The fire control switch was also tested by Bureau Veritas in April 17 and no faults were detected. So while acknowledging Dr. Lane's conclusions that there are no records confirming the fire lift switch at Grenfell Tower was properly maintained, nor are there records proving its performance was adequate, the TMO submits the inquiry may rely on the evidence of Mr. Howkins, supported by evidence from, from Peter's contractors, alongside other documentary evidence. The LFB has suggested that the fire control switch did not work because of debris found on examination following the fire. 
but Mr. Mr. Halkin stated the debris would be unlikely to have affected the operation of the switch had an express drop key of the correct dimensions been used. In his opinion, the firefighters failed to operate the switch correctly. Since the LFB was aware that a drop key was used across the TMO's property portfolio, it could have tested the switch with the key when it visited Grenfell Tower. While Mr. Halkins has suggested that Project 2 is a missed opportunity to consider upgrading for the TMO, missed opportunity for the TMO to consider whether it was possible to upgrade the lifts to full firefighting standards, and they should have considered the possibility at this stage. No industry professional involved in the refurbishment project brought this to the attention of the TMO, which Mr. Halkins suggested they should have done. He also states it would have been good practice for PEDAS to have highlighted to the TMO that the lift should be a full firefighting lift in so far as it was reasonably practical. This did not happen, and it's partly to explain why the lifts were not upgraded in the way suggested. So importantly, Colin Todd said, told the inquiry that London, to use his word, is awash with buildings that have firemen's lifts, and probably a day does not go past without a fire and rescue service somewhere in the country using a fireman's lift. Now, touching on the question of TMO's, TMO policies on firefighting lifts, Salbus was aware that the TMO lifts did not have all of the features of firefighting lifts and drafted the TMO statements on lifts, which was recorded thereafter in the fire risk assessments. The 2015, 16 and 17 fire safety strategies also clearly outlined the criteria the TMO is applying to firefighting lifts. While the TMO accepts the statement had theoretical capacity confused, it is submitted that it should have been relatively clear that the lifts did not meet the full firefighting lift criteria and were not being held out as such, especially to professionals reading the fire risk assessment. The LFB was in fact informed that TMO's lifts were not firefighting lifts on multiple occasions. And Matthew Ramsey noted in all evidence that by looking at the lift, and I quote again, I didn't believe that they were modern standard firefighting lifts. The TMO also attended various familiarization sessions at Grenfell Tower and across the TMO's housing stop, where they would take control of, lift, of the lifts using the fire control switch and drop key. Finally, and significantly it's submitted, Roger Anthony of Apex told the inquiry that he had never seen a fully compliant firefighting lift in any local authority building, which is supported. We submitted Colin Todd's evidence that he had never seen a block of flats with an evacuation lift. And so now, lastly, dealing with the topic on gas rises at Grenfell Tower before I come on to my conclusions. By the time of the fire, Cadent had reinstated the gas supply at Grenfell Tower via the new riser, but the boxing in of the laterals in the lobbies, in the lobbies had not been completed. Cadent, as a statutory undertaker, had the right to carry out works without obtaining planning permission and or, and or without the need to consult relevant stakeholders. Under the notifiable CDM design and build project for the replacement of the riser, Cadent was the client and Trio was the principal designer and principal contractor. The TMO held no CDM role and was not a party to the arrangement. In fact, it had been the TMO's preference to buy out the gas, thereby allowing residents to switch to electronic appliances and prevent further intrusive works taking place at Grenfell Tower. But in November 2016, Cadent decided that, and I quote again, a buyout was unachievable as it was unlikely that the required agreement of all gas users in the tower would be obtained as the majority of them still use their gas supply. Mr. Dolan, Mr. Dolan suggested the TMO restricted TO, TRIO, forgive me, from putting the riser on the external facade of the building. But in fact, it was never feasible to put it there as all the available space was occupied by residential accommodation and there were no common parts onto which the riser could be placed. Short of the riser running through residents' homes, which was impractical and undesirable, there was therefore no other practical route for the communal pipework. Struggling to find another solution, 
thus it was that TRIO requested permission for the pipe to be installed in the stale of Grenfell Tower, advising the TMO it was the most prudent way forward, and I quote. Mr Dolan also said the TMO approved the design, but this is incorrect, not least because the TMO had no design responsibility. TRIO thought they did not need to make an application to building control in relation to the works, which Beryl Menzies said was wrong. In fact, she considered the proposed works were in breach of the building regulations as the works made, and I quote again, made the situation worse in terms of fire safety on the basis that, again, to quote, to have a combustible gas supply in the only escape route and the firefighting shaft is very bad practice. TRIO represented to the TMO that it would carry out the work safely. Its emails contain the sign off, we work safely or not at all. The TMO did raise safety concerns with TRIO, tasking Carl Stokes with attending site and commenting on the news, new riser. And in an email dated the 10th of February, 2017, TRIO told the TMO in response, in response to safety concerns raised, and I quote, once the pipe network is installed, we will box in to provide fire protection and seal holes that are not needed to provide a flow of air through the box sections. On completion of our work, we will provide documentation to confirm the fire worthiness of our installation. Mr. Dolan accepted that it was TRIO's responsibility to evaluate the safety and compliance of the risers, noting that every project went through a design risk assessment, but he accepted in evidence that the design risk assessment process was flawed and weak. So the TMO acknowledges that residents, including the GTLA, raised concerns about the gas riser and that there was a request for the appointment of an independent health and safety advisor to consider the works. The TMO did pass these concerns on to TRIO and the National Grid and pressed them to respond as a matter of urgency. It also instructed Mr Stokes to assess the risks and sought further advice from him as the work progressed. He prepared a report which was passed on to TRIO and the National Grid. Janice Ray contacted Building Control and they said they would generally not be involved in such projects unless there was an impact on the means of escape. She advised them the work was impacted on the means of escape because the new riser was being installed in the single communal staircase. But despite this, building control did not consider it needed to be involved. So considering all of that information, in all the circumstances, submitted to Dr Lane's conclusion on the topic that KCTMO top management failed to seek assurance that the risk to relevant persons pending completion of those works was being adequately controlled are untenable. And so now, finally, conclusions. So the TMO acknowledges the immense tra tragedy of the Grenfell Tower fire, and nothing in these submissions is intended to diminish or detract from that tragedy. The TMO submits that the evidence heard in Module 3 shows its employees and officers were hardworking and diligent in their management of projects relating to Grenfell Tower including seeking the proper assurances on safety from expert contractors whom they employed or with whom, as with gas providers, gas providers on the national grid, they had only an arm's length relationship. While the TMO acknowledges that not all aspects of its management of the active and passive fire systems were optimal, whatever conclusion the inquiry reaches on the state of repair or maintenance of those systems, none was expected to perform in the extraordinary conditions that, are, that pertained on the night when non-compliant fire propagating products widely misrepresented and thus misunderstood have been installed. It's also suggested that on several of these topics, the inquiry should benchmark the TMO situation against that of other local authorities and or social housing, housing providers at the relevant time rather than holding the TMO to a higher standard applicable only through hindsight. And for example, sir, on the evacuation of disabled persons from high rise general needs blocks and peeps, the fact that this issue remains unresolved at a national level to this day, demonstrates that the TMO's approach was no different to that of any other UK provider of general needs social housing then or to this day. The inquiry will no doubt also well, the inquiry will no doubt also carefully consider the fact that, that non-compliance 
consider the non-compliance between the doors supplied by Mance Master Door and their test results were not confined to Grenfell Tower, but was on a national wide scale. And so can I say finally, the TMO continues to offer its full support to the inquiry in fulfilling its important statutory functions. And those are my submissions. Well, thank you very much indeed, Mr. Agaros. Um, <clears throat> that brings us to the end of the statements that are scheduled to be given today. But tomorrow there will be a further round of statements uh, when we shall hear from a number of other core participants. But for today, that's where the hearing ends. We rise now. We'll resume at 10 o'clock tomorrow. Thank you all very much.